um, ninety percent of our actions come from boredom. I mean, yeah. how do you relate that into what normal people will go through? Well, you know, um, uh, we it, it's hard uh, when you have like a, a job, a job, um, eight hours a day or whatever it is. Um, you're mostly spending your time waiting for the day to end. If you don't like the job, you know, it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay. You're living for the time when it's over. And your priorities in life become those free moments when you can escape. And you can escape going to a movie or going to a, a, a football match or, you know, find, going to bars and finding women or whatever it is. And that becomes like what you give you the weight to in life. That's what you're what, what you're looking forward to. Right. Um, and then, but but you can't fill up your whole life with these moments. Uh, you're going to be experiencing downtime, and so you you have this sort of constant need for distraction. It's an emptiness that you've got inside of you, and you can never quite fill it. And I see a lot of people. You know, technology helps them mm -hmm. in a bad way to feel like they can fill it up. They can check Facebook every minute. They can check their Blackberries all the time and feel like it. But it, not, none of that's coming from inside of you. It's all, you're all dependent on other people to do things for you. And at some point, uh, you have to realize that the boredom, the slow moments in life are actually not bad. They're, they're sort of letting you to slow down and you have to kind of confront yourself. And I would make the point in the book, you know, you were talking about how the media treats celebrities. They act as if somebody is famous just because they are who they are and they've got charisma. But, you know, 50 is an incredibly uh, disciplined person who works really, really, probably puts in 70 hours a week. Mm. And when he's not working, he's working out. <laughs> um, and he knows that that, that that kind of boredom, those slow moments, uh, he's not sitting there looking for drugs or alcohol. He wants, he's, he's into the, the discipline and to making himself tougher and harder. It's not like you can't have pleasure in life, but it's more like you take control of it and you can actually get a higher form of pleasure by disciplining yourself and learning to do something well, whether it's music or business or writing or, or whatever. Overcoming that fear people have of, of empty moments in life and learning to discipline it and find and have, being able to practice something and, and put up with the drudgery that's in, involved in learning music or whatever, that's a really important skill in life because if you never learn it, you're just going to be, you know, you're never going to master anything. Now, in Hollywood, just to get onto the Hollywood, you, what is, what is it like actually working in Hollywood? Because I mean, a lot of the times people hear a lot of stories, and um, how would you compare Hollywood to the music industry? You know, in terms of the negative aspects. Well, it's all kind of similar, uh, but the thing in Hollywood is, uh, in, in music, what makes them different from normal. Uh, businesses is the amounts of money that can be made so quickly um, so you're dealing with now budgets of movies that are you know 50 million 80 million dollars um, and stars who are getting huge salaries but also other people making very good money and whenever there's a lot of money to be made quickly people get very strange and get very political um, and egos become involved. And so it's as if uh, you had a, a normal business that everything was accelerated. Um, and instead of, you know, a company looking to make money over a two, three year period, you're thinking of, well, this six months, I've got to put out this movie and we've got to make so many millions of dollars. It makes people crazy. <laughs> um, you have the music business where it's, it's even a little more extreme because, um, you know, you, you don't have a film caught, you, know, you have hundreds of people that have to work on it. In a music business, uh, you don't have that many. So the money is almost even more. There's more money to be made by fewer people. And a, a star is, um, on, you know, the one 
person who's on the on the record or it's a group and so it, it's the, the money is so much and the politics are, are so intense and the egos are so much more extreme uh, that the game becomes that much more intense and then the difference with music you know uh, in film a lot of people from university backgrounds educate who are fairly educated go into the film business not all of them mm -hmm. uh, but music somehow attracts a lot can attract a lot of low-level sleaze bags and uh, <laughs> you know, 50, 50 talks about it you know it's almost like a mafia that get into, can get into the music business you don't need to have a university education to run a music label <clears throat> so you got a lot of um, uh, people there of dubious character um, and then you have you've got a business that's changing like film is changing too with piracy and everything else going on but music had it first in a much more extreme way and so when you've got all that money that you've been depending on and suddenly it's not there and the game is changing you've got people who are freaking out um, so you know, uh, the music business is probably the most extreme, difficult environment you could imagine. The only thing else I can think of, to be honest with you, that I think is almost as weird, is boxing. <laughs> the, the boxing world, where you have so much money involved, and uh, can be kind of similar. A lot of, you know, some corruption, put it that way. Yeah. Just a, per a perception. Do you feel that? I mean, some of the things that 50 actually puts out into the public domain actively seems like it's out in the industry and it's corrupt practices. Like, he will say things like, you know, the labels, they will, you know, get these CDs um, um, swiped four times to inflate the sales or they'll be buying their own CDs or... Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, so, I mean, has he become... And this is my own personal op opinion. Has he become more of a threat to the music industry than the asset, and, you know. I don't really know. I mean, uh, it's hard to tell because uh, you could say that maybe they, they're they angry about what he's doing. But on the other hand, he's just a money machine to them. Yeah. They don't have really much emotion uh, involved. It's just a dollars and cents. And the main thing would be if he could say all these bad things about the music business, he could reveal all of their tricks and all of the sleaze and all of the corruption. But if that record sold, they wouldn't give a damn. All they do is count the money. Okay, 50, let's have the next album. <laughs> you know, and you can tell us even more. They just are want to make money, particularly now. So the fact that his record, I'm not sure, I don't, I've heard it, it didn't do as well as he hoped. That's more of a consideration now where maybe he uh, would, be, you know, Interscope might not give him such a good deal and he might have to do things on his own or go somewhere else. Or maybe he stops doing records for a while um, or he figures out a new business model because he's never going to stop. He's not going to let, he's not going to let them control the game for him. He's going to figure something else out. But they're, they're so amoral and Machiavellian that it doesn't really matter what he what he does it's all about how much money he makes them right and um just going on to quickly um a couple of the other books i've yet to read the 33 strategies of war or the, um the art of seduction could you just like give me a quick overview about what those two books are actually about the art of seduction is basically a sequel to the 48 laws and it's, i'm saying that seduction is a the ultimate form of power in the modern world uh, where if you're able to seduce people and, and, and draw them in with your pleasant character and uh, you, you're somebody who, lit, who kind of is open and, and you have a pleasant personality, all of this gives you incredible room to maneuver people. It's a very powerful position to have. It's sort of a, kind of like a Bill Clinton type character. Um, so I look at seduction not just sexually, I mean, I talk a lot about that in the book, but as a form of power that you can have over people because everybody has resistances in the world. Nobody wants to listen to you. Nobody wants to do what you are asking them to do. But if you seduce them, you kind of melt all of their resistances, and then you have the power to move them in the direction you want, whether you want sex, whether you want their vote, or whatever. And then the 33 Strategies of 
War is the last of the series, and that's a book about strategy itself, because all my books are about strategies. And so it's sort of the groundwork for every, from all my books. And it's about, you know, these classic strategies of warfare, like a counterattack, um, like guerrilla warfare, um, or whatever. Um, but it's how these strategies apply to everything, how it applies to dealing with your children who are giving you problems, how to deal with your wife or your people in your office, or how to maneuver your business into the future. Everything is strategy. And so this is sort of a book. It looks at the mental aspect of any kind of uh, important maneuver or decision in life and how you could become the ultimate sort of warrior in this world. Okay, and... So now you've done those books, what will be next for you? Or what's the next project that you'll be working on? Uh, well, I have a book that's already sold. It's tentatively called The Master Player, but I'm not sure what that title will stick. And it's basically a look at what makes anybody a brilliant player in the game of life. Um, a sort of a way of, of thinking, uh, not so much of acting. Um, and if you master this new way of thinking in the world uh, that I'm going to reveal to you, then there's no limits to what you can do. And it's sort of a little bit like chapter eight in the 50th law about the importance of learning process, yeah. of getting a feel for things because you know them so well. And then once you understand the rules of the game and how things are played, then you have the power to break the rules and destroy the order that there is and create a new order. So it's all about kind of this ultimate power you, that's waiting for you there in life if you know how to think. And this is, you know, that's what the book's about. And, and with that, I mean, um, not, I wouldn't say do you worry, but um, how aware are you with that some people will take some of the secrets or some of the perceptions you're revealing and use it for negative purposes? Well, it happens, uh, and there's nothing you can do. People are they're bad people in the world, and uh, they're not going to need my books. They, the, book might, the book might help them figure out what they would have done any, anyway, maybe a little faster or a little better, and, I'm, and I, I, you know, that's not good. But more, most of the emails I get from people in the world, I say well over 90%, are people um, who are maybe a little bit naive, and then the book really, really helped them understand the world and get out of bad situations or bad relationships or bad jobs. So it's really more geared towards the underdog that doesn't understand how the game's played than for the person already on the top who's got there because they already are aggressive and ambitious and amoral. It's more for the little man and woman out there who maybe doesn't really know how the game is or should be played is played by others. Right. And um, in closing, what would you say is, I mean, because obviously you live in America, um, and what's your take on the, the political and economical challenges that, you know, the country's facing at the moment? Well, you know, they're, they're pretty humongous, but everything comes down to uh, almost basic human psychology and uh, you know, a person like Barack Obama, whom I very much supported, and I still support, uh, was dealt an almost impossible hand. And uh, America's going to, if we're not careful, we're going to end up like Italy, where, you know, we have no patience for a party to be in power long enough to do anything necessary or strong. We're, 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 we're so impatient. Uh, he's only been in office one year, mm -hmm. and yet people are already turning on him. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who came in during a maybe worse situation, mm -hmm. certainly worse, uh, there was more leeway for someone like that. He had several years to work with. So the pressures are intense. Uh, you know, it's, uh, the time frame is so much shrunken. And uh, it's almost impossible. I mean, it's almost impossible for one man to do anything. I think America has uh, some rough times ahead. We might pull out of this, we will pull out of it, uh, but our whole mentality uh, has shifted from a country of people of energy and entrepreneurial spirit and getting things done to a country of people who are, a lot of them 
are, are, are weak and dependent on, on drugs and, and, and eat too much and yeah. watch too much television. And, you know, so it's not so much the pol- leadership, it's more like the American people have to wake up and we have to, if, if we have to have a revolution or something, whatever, from the bottom up. I'm not so thinking about from the top down, I'm thinking from the bottom up what's going on in the country is is troubling and we'll just have to see what happens you know